Chapter 3 The Hotel Owner It was fine May weather as I travelled north that day, and as I watched the fields and the trees and the flowers, I wondered why, when I had been a free man, I had stayed in London. I bought some sandwiches at lunchtime. I also bought the morning newspaper and read a little about South East Europe. When I had finished, I got out Scudder's black book and studied it. It was almost full of writing, mostly numbers, although sometimes there was a name. For example, I found the words Hofgard, Loonville, and Avocado quite often. The word I saw the most was Pavia. I was certain that Scudder was using a code. I have always been interested in codes. I enjoy games and numbers and things like that. It seemed to be a number code, where groups of numbers replace letters. I worked on the words, because you can use a word as a key in a number code. I tried for hours, but none of the words helped. Then I fell asleep and woke up at Dumfries, just in time to take the local train into Galloway. There was a man on the platform who worried me a little. He was watching the crowd more closely than I liked. But he didn't look at me, and when I saw myself in a mirror, I understood why. With my brown face and my old clothes, I looked just like all the other hill farmers who were getting into the local train. I travelled with a group of these farmers. The train travelled slowly through narrow valleys and then up onto an open moor. There were lakes, and in the distance I could see high mountains. At five o'clock the carriage was empty and I was alone. I got out at the next station, a tiny place in the middle of the moor. An old man was digging in the station garden. He stopped, walked to the train, collected a packet, and went back to his potatoes. A ten-year-old child took my ticket, and I came out of the station onto a white road across the moor. It was a beautiful, clear spring evening. I felt like a boy on a walking holiday, instead of a man of thirty-seven very much wanted by the police. I walked along that road whistling, feeling happier every minute. After some time, I left the road and followed a path along a little stream. I was getting tired when I came to a small house. The woman who lived there was friendly and said I could sleep there. She also gave me an excellent meal. Her husband came home from the hills later in the evening. We talked about cows and sheep and markets and I tried to remember some of the information I heard, because it might be useful. By ten o'clock I was asleep, and I slept until five o'clock in the morning. The couple refused any money, and by six o'clock I had eaten breakfast and was moving again. I wanted to get back to the railway at a different station. Then I would go back to the east towards Dumfries. I hoped that if the police were following me, they would think that I had gone on to the coast in the west, where I could escape by ship. I walked in the same beautiful spring weather as before, and still couldn't make myself feel nervous or worried. After a time, I came to the railway line, and soon a little station, which was perfect for my plan. There was just a single line and moors all around. I waited until I saw a train in the distance and then bought a ticket to Dumfries. The only person in the carriage was an old farmer with his sheepdog. He was asleep and next to him was a newspaper. I picked it up to see if there was any news about me. There was only a short piece about the Langham Place murder. My servant Paddock had called the police, and the milkman had been arrested. The poor man had spent most of the day with the police, but they had let him go in the evening. 
the police believed that the real murderer had escaped from London on a train to the north. When I had finished reading, I looked out of the window and noticed that we were stopping at the station where I had got out yesterday. Three men were talking to the man who I had seen digging potatoes. I sat well back from the window and watched carefully. One of the men was taking notes, and I supposed they were from the local police. Then I saw the child who had taken my ticket talking, and the men looked out across the moor along the road I had taken. As we left the station, the farmer woke up, looked at me, and asked where he was. He had clearly drunk too much. I'm like this. Because I never drink," he said sadly. "I haven't touched whisky since last year, not even at Christmas. And now I've got this terrible headache. What did it?" I asked. "A drink they call brandy. I didn't touch the whisky because I don't drink, but I kept drinking this brandy. I'll be ill for a fortnight." His voice got slower. And slower, and soon, he fell asleep again. I had planned to leave the train at a station, but now it stopped by a river, and I decided this would be better. I looked out of the carriage window, and saw nobody. So I opened the door, and dropped quickly down into the long grass. My plan was going perfectly, until the dog. Decided that I was stealing something, and began to bark loudly. This woke up the farmer, who started to shout. He thought I was trying to kill myself. I crawled through the long grass for about a hundred meters, and then looked back. The train driver and several passengers were all staring in my direction. Luckily, the dog was now so excited. That he pulled the farmer out of the carriage, the farmer began to slide down towards the river. The other passengers ran to help him. The dog bit somebody, and there was a lot of excited shouting. Soon they had forgotten me, and the next time I looked back, the train was moving again. I was now in the middle of the empty moor, and for the first time. I felt really frightened, not of the police, but of the people who knew that I knew Scudder's secret. If they caught me, I would be a dead man. I reached the top of a low hill and looked around. To the south, a long way away, I saw something, which made me tremble. Low in the sky, a small plane was flying slowly across the moor. I was certain that it was looking for me, and I was also certain that it was not the police. I hid low in the heather, and watched it for an hour or two as it flew in circles. Finally, it disappeared to the south. I did not like this spying from the air. And I began to think that an open moor was perhaps not the best place to hide. I could see distant forests in the east, and decided that would be better country. It was about six o'clock in the evening when I left the moor and entered the trees. I came to a bridge by a house, and there on the bridge was a young man. He was sitting smoking a pipe, dreamily watching the water and holding a book. He jumped up as he heard my feet on the road, and I saw a friendly young face. "Good evening to you," he said in a serious voice. "It's a fine night to be on the road." The smell of cooking came from the house. "Is that house a hotel?" I asked. "It certainly is. I'm the owner, and I hope you'll stay the night because I've been alone for a week." I sat down next to him and got out my pipe. I began to think this young man might help me. "You're young to own a hotel," I said. 
My father died a year ago, and now it's mine. It's not an exciting job for a young man like me. I didn't choose to do it. I want to write books. You've got the right job, I said. With all the travellers you meet, you could be the best storyteller in the world. Not today, he said. Two hundred years ago, there were exciting people on the road, but today there are only cars full of fat old women and fishermen. You can't make stories out of them. I want to sail up an African river, or live in an Indian village, and write about things like that. The hotel looked peaceful in the evening sun. I've travelled a bit, I said, and I'd be happy to live in a peaceful place like this. And perhaps you're sitting next to an adventure now. I'll tell you a true story, and you can make a book of it if you like. I told him I was in the gold business in Africa, and I had discovered a group of international thieves. They had chased me to England and had killed my best friend. I described a chase across the desert, and an attack on the ship from Africa. And I described the Langham Place murder in detail. You want adventure, I said. Well, here it is. The thieves are chasing me now, and the police are chasing them. It's wonderful, he whispered. You believe me? I said gratefully. Of course I do, he said. I can believe anything strange. It's things that happen every day that are difficult to believe. He was very young, but he was the man I needed. I think my enemies have lost me for the moment, but I must hide and rest for a day or two. Will you help me? He jumped up, and led me to the house. You'll be safe here. I can keep a secret, and you'll tell me some more about your adventures, won't you? As I entered the hotel, I heard the sound of an engine. In the sky to the west was my enemy, the plane. He gave me a room at the back of the house. I asked him to watch out for cars and planes, and sat down to work on Scudder's little book. As I have said, it was a number code. I had to find the word that was the key to it, and when I thought of the million words it might be, I felt hopeless. But the next afternoon, I remembered that Scudder had said a woman called Julia Chichenyi. Was the key to the Carolides business. So I tried her name as the code key. It was the answer. In half an hour, I was reading, with a white face. Suddenly, I heard the sound of a car stopping outside the hotel. Ten minutes later, my young friend came up to my room, his eyes bright with excitement. There are two men looking for you," he whispered. "They're downstairs now, having a drink. They described you very well. I told them you had stayed here last night and had left this morning. I asked him to describe them. One was a thin man with dark eyes. The other was always smiling and lisp. They were both English. My young friend was certain of this. I took a piece of paper, and wrote these words in German. I made it look like one page of a private letter. Black stone. Scudder had discovered this, but he could do nothing for a fortnight. I don't think it's any good now, because Carolides is uncertain about his plans. But. If Mister T advises, I will do the best I. Give this to them, and say you found it in my bedroom. Ask them to return it to me if they find me. Three minutes later, the car began to move. From behind the curtain, I saw two men in it, one thin, 
one fatter. The young man came back. He was very excited. That paper woke them up, he said happily. The thin man went white, and the fat one whistled. Then they left as quickly as they could. Now I'll tell you what I want you to do. I said, "Go to the police station, and describe the two men to them. Say you think they may have something to do with the London murder. I'm sure those two men will be back here tomorrow morning for more information about me. Tell the police to be here early." At about eight o'clock the next morning, I watched three policemen arrive. They hid their car and came into the hotel. Twenty minutes later, another car came towards the hotel, but stopped in some trees about two hundred meters away. The two men inside walked up to the hotel. I had planned to hide in my bedroom and see what happened. But now I had a better idea. I wrote a note to thank the young man for his help, opened my window, and dropped out. Watching the hotel carefully, I walked back towards the car in the trees, jumped in, and drove away.